Hello and welcome. Thank you for being here today. I'm Diane Boyd, the director of the Big Air Center, and we are excited to welcome Dr. Megan Rogers Good, the director of academic assessment at Auburn. And today she is going to share with us an exciting way to reframe that old bugbear assessment into transformative learning for our students. So yeah. Thank you, Megan. Thank excited. you. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for coming to this um, PDS. Again, I'm Megan Good. I'm new to Auburn. I just joined the Auburn University family or community in July this past year, so I haven't been here quite a year yet. So <laughs> thank you all for coming. And this is going to be really small group discussion-y, so I do have some slides and I'll give you a lot of information, but I'm hoping that we are having more of a big conversation together. And also, um, if you came thinking about the assessment mechanics, I have a lot of other workshops that are available about the details, but this conversation is going to be really big picture, so I just want to kind of frame that we're in big picture, but I'm happy to stay after and talk more detailed assessments, so this is kind of an overview there. Okay, so you might be like, I don't understand why there's information about learning improvement and PIGS and where is this all coming from. So recently my colleagues and I put out a paper called A Simple Model for Learning Improvement, Way Pig Feed Pig, Way Pig. And so I'm talking about today, but I want to give a shout out to my colleagues. Um, we all have a common denominator that is James Madison University. And so Keston Fulcher was my advisor in my doctoral work at JMU. I'm now at Auburn and my colleague Chris Coleman is at the University of Alabama, oh, <laughs> which I'm not sure if I'm going to get in trouble for putting that on a slide, but <laughs> that's where he is. And then Kristen is also at JMU. And so together we're trying to think about assessment not so much as just how you're putting together reports and thinking about just assessment of student learning, but how can assessment be used to evidence learning improvement, which to me is the most exciting possibility with assessment. So we'll get into the pig business a little bit later, but I wanted to give you at least an initial frame of reference. And I have a couple copies of the paper if you're interested. So the first thing I want to do, which we'll do in just a moment, is introductions of all of you so I know who you are, where you're coming from, and something that you hope to learn during the um, professional development seminar. Some things that I'm going to share is just an introduction to program assessment. I know we all can think about the word assessment in different ways, and so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page on how we think about assessment. We'll get into the business about pigs and learning improvement, and we'll think about some barriers to learning improvement. Towards the end, I'm going to ask you all to envision a fantasy land where we are able to remove all those barriers and think about the possibilities that we have with learning at a program level. And finally, if we have time, hopefully, I'd like to invite you all to strategize with me about how Auburn University can be a leader in the learning improvement movement in the assessment world, if that makes sense. Also, if you have questions, just feel free to raise your hand at any time. Um, it's a pretty small group, so I think we can have a discussion together. And so if you have a question, don't wait till the end. Just go ahead and raise your hand, and that'll be good with me. So now I'd like to go around, and if each of you could give me your name, what program you're affiliated with, and also one thing that you hope to learn during the workshop, I would appreciate it. Thank you again so much for coming. Um, I hope we're going to answer some of your questions, but some of them might be a piece of a larger kind of pie that we're going to talk about today. So I want to begin by asking you all a question just to see what your response is and have a discussion about why do we practice program assessment in the first place. I mean, I do. <laughs> yeah. Can we talk? Ooh, go ahead. Keep getting the money. <laughs> Keep getting the money. Tell me about that. <clears throat> to do good things, we need green things. And then we ask us, and then we say, good thing is successful. Give us green things, so good thing can keep going. Ah, so you're saying that by showing your programs are effective, you can ask for money and then help make them even more effective. It's a very crude way of putting it, but. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. If it's working. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. Improvement. Continuous improvement. Continuous improvement. Very good. Other reasons? Becoming more efficient. Tell me a little bit more about that. Uh, sometimes you can find through assessment that you have a reduplication of many efforts, mm -hmm. or maybe that a practice is uh, taking too much administrative time, and so you're able to uh, make meaningful, hopefully, outcomes for maybe improving that streamline. Right, so improvement, efficiency. Effectiveness. Effectiveness. Making sure that we 
bigger than what we intended to do. Right. So quality, effectiveness, good. I've almost never asked that question and not got a negative or cynical question, response. We were holding back. <laughs> holding back. We, I don't want you to hold back. Right. What, um, Academic program review, we have to do it. Yeah. We have to do <laughs> it. Accreditation yeah. requirements. Accreditation requirements. Mm -hmm. Why are there accreditation requirements? Well, funding is certainly tied into some of that, but um, I mean, I think it's just the whole idea of are you doing what you say you're doing. Right. Who, so, who asked yeah. that question? Not I want to pick on us. Awesome no, anyway. who, well, who asked the question of, are we doing what we say we're doing? If the students knew what to ask, they would ask that question. Some of them do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so students might ask. So when I changed my majors as an undergrad, I never said, oh, well, I'm going to switch to this major because they are better at assessing how well they reach their learning outcomes. I didn't. No, no one probably does. <laughs> but I did measure, I mean, I did have certain goals in mind, right? Oh, if I get this. Mm -hmm. Degree, then I'll be. It'll be more fulfilling. It'll, you know, mm -hmm. maybe career-wise better things like that. So you had some self-assessment during that your path. Mind, right? mm -hmm. Good, Diane, you're. Well, so if we're thinking about accreditation, right? Who asks mm -hmm. us about this? So bodies that are concerned with consistency in academic preparation for students ask <coughs> that question. But we are those bodies, right? Right. Well, and there are bodies beyond our bodies, right? External. External so, accrediting, yes. But so, even those external bodies, I mean, when we have a SACS visit, it's our peers that come to visit us. I'm thinking of like ACSB, oh, okay. business the disciplinary stuff. accreditors, right. yeah. Well, at this day and age, it's even the public. They want, they're wanting to know all this money that you know my kids or my neighbor or my tax dollars are going into these yeah. programs. Are they really outputting what they say? Right. Parents and families and students. Yes. So you all, you all are right. I think. Um, it's easy to think about, we have to do assessment, and the first why, in a more negative sense, is because SACS makes us do it. But then if we dig a little bit deeper, there's five regional accreditors. We're in the South, so Southern, Accredi Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, so SACS. Um, but all five of them have a requirement that all academic degree programs assess their student learning, and all student support services and administrative units all have to assess not learning for the administrative units, but their effectiveness. And then you start to think, well, why do they want to make us do that? Because if, if you haven't done meaningful assessment, it might just feel like busy work and a bureaucratic act activity, right? I don't know if y'all have felt that way, but I've heard that at other institutions. And so. And the question about the standards, is that part of the reasons to for, for those associations, like the business school, I know, to be a part of this international business school? Basic accreditation because once you get that, it's a stamp of a uh, seal of approval, yes. endorsement. Mm -hmm. But for them to do that, they have to send it now. Then, right. Teams, just what it says, are they meeting, like you said, are they meeting mm -hmm. the outcomes, objectives, and how well they do? Are they following up the, the ladder since they last time they were assessed? Right. So within the disciplines, there's disciplinary accreditors who not only want to make sure you're doing it yourself, but they're saying, here are the things that your students should know. And in some ways, that's not bad, right? I want to make sure that if I'm getting surgery, that the surgeon operating, they know some things and they have passed the test that makes me feel assured that they actually know what they're doing, right? But across the board, not all disciplines have an accreditor. So this regional body is saying, we need you to assess your student learning. And why? It's really at what Chandra's saying. So higher education has gotten way more expensive over the last 20, 30 years, right? Students are graduating with a lot of debt, they're not always getting jobs, and they're not always sure which jobs to get. So you have policymakers, parents, students, all questioning if it's really worth the investment of college in the first place. And so one way that they can try to answer that question is by requiring that programs show that they are effective and that the money that they're receiving from the state, the federal government, is being put to good use. So I, I don't mean to go on super sidebar, but I think it's often helpful to kind of think of the really big picture of why we're here for assessment just as a situational factor for the rest of our conversation. But are there any questions at this moment? We're, we're going to get super big picture right now and we'll only go smaller. <laughs> Good? Okay. So I just want to make sure we're all talking about assessment in the same way. Um, the slide that you have before you is the program assessment cycle. And so this is typically used to think about an academic degree program like psychology bachelor's program, for example. 
student learning outcomes in the assessment cycle are thinking about the end of an academic degree program. So right before a student walks across the stage in psychology, I'm just making that one up as an example, what do they expect no students to know, think, or do as a result of their four years in this program? Maybe slightly less. Or even if it's a graduate program, you were here at Auburn for two years and a master's degree, what do we hope that you know, think, or do as a result of your time here? Next, the program then thinks about, well, how do those outcomes align with the curriculum that we're offering? So most programs have a set of required courses that are supposed to help students achieve the outcomes that they set forward for their program. So those two steps alone, if we're starting from square one, could take a couple years because you have to get everyone to buy into one set of student learning outcomes and really think about how that aligns with your curriculum, which is easy to put on a slide, but the details can get really tricky, right? So next we think about, okay, we know what our outcomes are, we know where students are experiencing the curriculum to achieve these outcomes, then we have to measure it. Which measuring student learning, as faculty you all do this all the time, but to think about it at a program level and to do it in a reliable and valid way is also pretty tricky if, we, if we're trying to do it in a very solid way. Next, you have to report and interpret the results. And then at the end of the day, as I think Dale said, we're going to use the results for improvement. So is this a new image to anyone, or is this pretty familiar to folks? Pretty familiar. So just curious, how similar and different is this from course level assessment in your perspective? So we're thinking about the whole program. Is it so different or similar to course assessment? How you might assess student learning in your own course? It should be parallel. It should be parallel. Okay. It may be semantics, but you said how does the outcomes align with the curriculum? Mm -hmm. Whereas when I'm thinking of my course, I think of how does my syllabus align with my desired outcomes. Right. Or the activities so, that you're so doing the in the syllabus. Is the desired outcomes, not the given syllabus or the given curriculum. Right. Possibly. Right. So it's a little smaller. Absolutely. Right. The, uh, my previous job on campus was with a college, and I had a chance, the pleasure, if I could say, of working pretty closely with assessment. Mm -hmm. And I always found across the college, and I always found the programs uh, that were the most where the programmatic <laughs> goals were mapped all the way down into specific. Uh, assignments mm -hmm. had the most effective, uh, I guess, system, if you could, mm -hmm. or measurement or meaningful data. Right. Um, and I thought that was, yeah, that was a good relationship. So it might be, for some cases, a small wheel of assessment, just faculty members curious about the outcomes of their course, doesn't go beyond that. Then there's big assessment, but there's also the connection of the two wheels in alignment, which is not a bad thing, right? Right. Any other comments or thoughts? I think it's really easy to skip the learning outcomes and think about what you want to do and how you want to. So you have an activity in mind, and then you work backwards, and oh, well, we got to make an outcome that reaches this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some, I think it's important, especially in a course, when you're thinking about it, you're assessing, OK, I really love this activity, but is this valuable? Is this going to be derailing us from the topic of discussion? Is mm -hmm. this going to be meaningful? Right. So, and think about the parallel there. So, even, so maybe you're an instructor and you're like, these are the things I'm doing and now I'm going to think about my outcomes. You have a lot of control over those activities to change them, but at the program, this curriculum is set. I mean, it can be changed, but it's a lot more difficult if you decide you want a new outcome or to get rid of one to make those changes. So that's just a, we'll plant that one in the back because we'll come back to this issue here. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about something about, at a national level, we think about program assessment, and it's going to sound sad, but it's going to end <laughs> up hopeful, okay? So the national assessment promise is essentially this assessment cycle that I've just shared with you. So across the nation, you go into any institution and you talk to their assessment person on campus, they'll show you the cycle, and almost all of them will say, we're going to use the results for improvement. Hopefully they're not saying we're doing it because of regional accreditation, but that's also a possibility. So the, the heart and the sentiment of assessment has always been about using the results for improvement. But, so that's the emphasis there. But the reality is that often what happens is that we go through the assessment process and it ends in an assessment report, right? 
any discussion. <laughs> Say that again. So often programs will create outcomes, they'll align it with the curriculum, they'll measure the outcomes, report results, and instead of using them, they might just create a report that then gets filed off and maybe doesn't spur into that hope that we all have assessment comes out of, right? But it's okay, we're going to think about the hopeful things, but first a little bit more of the sad parts. So. <laughs> The idea that assessment is not yielding use of results for improvement is not, it's not specific to Auburn or any university in particular. This is a national problem. So many, some of you might have heard of George Koo. He created the National um, Survey of Student Engagement, the NESI, which was just sent to students this week, so they might talk about that. Um, and he's a part of this group, National Institute of Learning Outcomes Assessment, that has a real heavy pulse on the state of assessment across the nation. And so, I'll let you all read this quote. What does that mean to, to you? The results are not translated into improvements. So right. They are, they are shelved there. So, most of our universities are measuring learning, we're doing assessment. But that, that point of the whole thing, the using the assessment results, is rare, right? So this is where the idea of the pig comes into play. So I ask you, has a pig ever fattened because we weighed it? No. Why not? That is psychologically manipulated. <laughs> what? Are they psychologically manipulated to believe yeah. that's good and wait so now? <laughs> <laughs> no. Maybe. The answer is no. <laughs> no. Why not? And this is, if you haven't heard the kind of reference, like you want to fatten up a pig, right? So the way the pig, and the, the hope is that the pig gets fatter, right? So how do we make the pig fatter? You increase. You feed it. You feed Make it. Make an administrator. Just Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, it's, so it's, the same, it's the same idea, right? You, just because you measure a pig, it's not going to automatically get fatter. Just because we assess student learning does not mean learning will magically become greater, right? But I think in that assessment promise, that's what most assessment folks are trying to say. Do assessment, student learning will get better. But it's a lot more complicated than that. So just to give a parallel, this is what the simple model for learning improvement is. And we put simple model in quotes because it's obviously much more complicated when you start to break it down. But the idea is that you assess student learning at graduation. Where are your students right now? And if you want to improve anything, you have to do something differently. You have to make a change at the program level, which gets complicated. And then, if you make a program level change, let's say it's a master's program because that's easier. If you change all four semesters, you have to wait two years for a new group of students to experience the new actual changes, right? And then you reassess future years to see, okay, are our cohorts now stronger because of the changes that we made? So to really evidence learning improvement in your program, you have to assess, intervene, and do something differently, and then reassess. So this is really hard, <laughs> right? So are there examples of learning improvement? That's, that's a um, question I had when I first came across this type of information. In 2009, some assessment folks, Trudy Banta is kind of one of the leaders in the assessment world. Um, these three colleagues reviewed 150 of the best examples of assessment across the nation that they could find. So keep in mind that every institution has 20 to at Auburn, 250 academic degree programs. They're only looking at the best programs within 150 institutions. Only 6% of these best examples demonstrated learning improvement. 6%. Right? That's crazy. Right? Why is this happening? Maya. What are the time frames over which this change was measured? Sorry? The time frames over this over which this change was measured? Like the learning improvement, it have to be multiple years. It couldn't just be one year. Right. Mm -hmm. And just one change for assessment, pre-assessment? Probably only want to change one outcome. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But why don't we see more evidence of learning improvement? 
It's easy to say assessment leads to improved student learning, but why don't we actually see more of that when you dig in? There's a power dynamic. I think when you are creating assessment and you're finding recommend, you're recommending things to change, and sometimes as the one doing the assessment, you're not able or have the ability to make those changes, or there might be some other key restrictions that could be budget, that could be timing, that could be the political environment. So I think that there's the nature of assessment currently is sometimes recommending and providing it to others, and at some point you just have to let the bird go and hope it flies. And so right. I think there's that piece. Mm -hmm. If I was a cheat sheet, you said something in your previous slide about <laughs> multiple student measures that they are not closing the loop. Because mm -hmm. there used to be alignment when they had the, I think some of them mentioned, if you have a program curriculum, program assessment outcomes, they ask you to drill down to the subject um, outcomes, uh, then objectives or goals, however they define it. But there used to be alignment of continuous checking, iterative checking to make sure that those goals are being reached, are being hit, are being accomplished. Because if you don't do that, you don't close the loop. And if you don't close the loop, they're going to show the bottom line, which is the way they find 6%. The best schools, if the best schools out there, I don't know what's going on with it, but the guy is not so proficient. Mm -hmm. Are you, really? Is a summary of your statement, you're getting a lot of different good issues, that the assessment itself has to be aligned and well-developed in the first place? Or is it beyond yeah, that? Going back to the previous mm -hmm. slide, about number one, multiple student measures, they are not aligned. So you, I, I'm trying to... Um, you know, measure different ways of measuring. So right. it's not otherwise, not, there's no coherence. That's oh, the first. I see. The second is closing the loop. Mm -hmm. So the closing the loop, the other, uh, the statement I made in support of closing the loop mm -hmm. is it's got to have coherence, alignment to the other. I say all of every department of school has their own program outcomes. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when you talk with the faculty, there's not necessarily alignment. Sometimes you want to do something that's going to uh, emphasize yes. your student learning. But you might have to do something different. Like right. I may have said something about like that when the first came, you have mm -hmm. to change. So if you don't have that coherence of that common vision, and right. everybody that's aligned, then yes. it's aligned, then it's just going back to what you said about yeah. multiple sort of measures and closing the loop. So you have to have all of your assessment has to be aligned, the measures have to be aligned to the outcomes, but not just on paper in reality. So all of the faculty need to be aware of the alignment and on board and coherence across the program and the assessment. Yeah. So faculty yeah. turnover could be an issue. Faculty turnover? Yeah. Between the faculty and the department leadership. Mm -hmm. And just getting faculty buy in, they hear the word assessment, and, or they don't think they need to change. Yeah. Just, and then following up on that to make sure they're doing it. Yeah. Buy in I mean, a if big we went back to what Danny said, something about you know how the people who are doing the measurement and trying to suggest the changes are sometimes removed from the from the everyday processes of implementing those. Mm -hmm. And so then the flip side of that is that maybe a lot of faculty feel, oh, assessment, that's something that's something that that person does, mm -hmm. not something that I do, have to do. Right. And that, I mean, that creates a disconnect. Yeah. I think the idea of faculty buy-in is, is really important. I mean, mm -hmm. it's true that you know if you can ask any question and get data from it, but if it's not a good question, mm -hmm. your, your data's not going to be good data. But even when you ask the right question, you get good data, you know, we can make recommendations mm -hmm. to the faculty, but you know, that's part of being at the university level, there's this culture of strong independence in terms mm -hmm. of how you develop your own course and mm -hmm. what you do within that course. Right. And um, some people are not real amenable to suggestions that they include more writing mm -hmm. in the class right. uh, or you know, something along that, mm -hmm. along that line. So yeah, this is a great point. So writing is a great example because in any particular discipline outside of writing, right, faculty may or may not feel like they're experts at that subject. And if at the end of the entire program students don't do so well, it's like, well, it wasn't me or it was you, or we can't really disentangle it, so let's just potentially skip it, right? So it makes it actually challenging. So everything you all said is right, and I hope that that sheds clarity on why across the nation we don't have very many examples of learning improvement because it's very complicated and when it gets into a lot of different issues that come into play, so there are a lot of barriers. But in the next half hour, <laughs> I'm going to ask you all to pretend that there weren't any barriers and how might it work in that case, but not, not quite yet. 
So I want to give you all an example just to make this a little bit clearer and highlight the timeline issue that y'all have brought up. So let's pretend that this is a program in um, my new hypothetical program I've been working on is Forrest Gump studies, so it's not real, obviously. But students have this degree program that they go through, and this year when they graduate in May, we're assessing their writing skills. There are other outcomes, but this is we're just talking about writing. They're using a four-point rubric to measure writing, and the faculty love this rubric. It's got reliability evidence. They're using multiple raters. It's valid. Everything about the measurement is perfect is another assumption we can't always make, right? They find that out of the four-point scale, the average score of their graduating class is a 2.5. And they're a little bit unhappy with that. So they decide they're going to write across the curriculum. They're going to get everybody together. They're going to talk about how they're scaffolding across the program, who's teaching what, how's it all going. And everybody's buying into this process in this example. But still, at this point, it's only a change. You can't call it an improvement yet, right? Or can I call this an improvement? <clears throat> well, depends on the question, but the fact that you come up with what to change is a success, and it's worthy of celebrating that. It is what, worthy of celebrating your changes, that's right. But do you, do you really know if it's or an improvement it? yet? It's, it's or is it? You or know, is it? it's meaningful yet. What's, what's behind the 2.5 score? What trends are there that, could, that are contributing to that? This is possibly a whitewash approach to a very specific problem. Right. So we don't we don't know at this point, right? right. So I could reveal the next box and it could be 2.5 and then we're all going to scratch our heads, right? <laughs> but in this example, it just magically worked out that in 2020, so that's four years later, the average score was a 3.5 on the same scale on the same scale, which is also a barrier, right? Because often the assessment metrics will change over a four-year period. So you have to keep that in mind. At this point, we can say it's an improvement. We improve student learning and writing, and we have evidence of that. But are there any questions about this? Did the student income and qualifications yes. possibly change? That's a very good question. How do we know students just get, didn't get smarter, that the high school is better prepared them for writing? Very good question. We can tackle that. So if any of you all are interested in learning improvement, I'm going to go resource heavy into any program that wants to do this. So we can, we can handle this. We could do pre-post assessment and measure the change. So was the change from freshman to senior year bigger in 2020 than 2016? We can also do statistical controls of the demographic data to say, of the subsets that are very similar, do we see growth? So there are ways of, that's a very critical question that will almost always poke a hole, but we can plug the hole and <laughs> tell the story. <laughs> so that's a great question. All right. So what I'm trying to say, in, a lot, um, in addition to a lot of other things, is this assessment is typically not synced with curricular innovation. So that's not to say there's not excellent assessment work going on at every university. I'm sure that's true. But there's also curricular innovations going on, and often they're not aligned. Assessments over here, we're doing that because Sachs tells us to, and maybe we're taking it very seriously, but what we really care about and what we're really trying to improve student learning on is over here. We're not measuring it, we're doing this big thing, but we're not assessing it. So part of the learning improvement problem is thinking about what do you really want to see growth on, and it might be an outcome you haven't created yet. Maybe your discipline is moving in a direction where teamwork is what the employers want. And you could be the first program to really demonstrate learning improvement and teamwork. Assess that while at the very beginning, then do these huge curricular changes, or even just small curricular changes, and then reassess. But does that make sense that these two things have to be aligned? If you want to evidence learning improvement. So what are some other reasons we don't see evidence of learning improvement? We've got a pretty good list of barriers, but I just want to make sure there aren't any more that y'all can think of. The other part about faculty, you know, again, you get some variation as well. So if I'm grading freshman writing, then am I mentally already saying, oh yeah, you know, for a freshman, this is really a three out of four. But then when they're seniors, I'm saying, oh, for a senior, this is definitely a three out of a four. So is a three really a three? Mm -hmm. So training on the measurement side can be an issue, too. Yeah. 
In all these examples, we're assuming the measurement is great. And that is a very difficult first step that has to be really well aligned that you wouldn't ask that question at the end of the day because there would be such, so much training that we know exactly how to use the rubric, <laughs> no matter which population you're looking at. Yeah. This might be, again, controversial or provocative. How about if students just don't want to learn, which is what we see in our course? So that's where I would say that is not within my realm of expertise, but I have friends at the Beginner Center <laughs> I'm working with them. <laughs> that, that would help with those issues. And that's another thing if you do read the paper that we, we point out also. So most faculty are not trained to be experts at assessment. Fair, right? Are faculty trained to be experts at teaching, learning, curriculum, and pedagogy? Sometimes. But, but not always. All of you are here at this video event, so you're probably on the expert side. But across the board, that's just not historically how faculty were trained. And so it's hard, even if you get the assessment piece down, which is challenging, to think about how are you going to make this curricular, like how are you going to facilitate that conversation? What are we actually going to do in the classes? So what Diane and I have been trying to talk about is like, if programs are interested in this work, I can help with the assessment side, and Diane and her and Stephanie and the Biggio Center can help with the curricular innovation side. So we're thinking about how can we put our resources together to help make a really big impact at the program level. Because classroom improvements are awesome, right? But think about the impact of every graduate experience is an improved experience. What a cool story for me, I think, that is to tell. I don't know. Others get as excited, but <laughs> I get excited about it. Yay. Okay, so at this point, you're probably feeling a little sad, like, gosh, <laughs> assessment's not doing everything it was promised to do. Nobody else is doing it. I mean, everyone's doing it, and there's some positive value in assessment in and of itself. But let's say we did want to do this, even though there's a laundry list of barriers. How do we do it? So in the pink paper, we talk about these four things in a little bit more detail and we provide an example. But the first thing is to identify one outcome. So sometimes when you talk to assessment folks, you might hear you have to improve every outcome every year. That is, in my opinion, unreasonable, right? These outcomes guide your entire program. What is the one outcome that the assessment results might show needs to be improvement, or maybe just affectively the faculty talk about a lot. Like, we really wish X, Y, or Z in our students. If we could change that, that would be awesome. My guess is that most faculty members might be able to identify one thinking about the graduate level, as they graduate, right? So next, let's say we all come together and identify a targeted outcome, which is not easy. Then you have to think about, well, what are we already doing on this outcome? In some cases, it could be totally new, like that teamwork example. Like, we haven't been doing teamwork, but we're going to start trying. So that could be totally new for everyone. But in other cases, it's just kind of having a conversation and having the program get on the same page about what they're doing. Like, oh, you're teaching writing there? I didn't know. I thought I was teaching for the first time and just having that kind of program level conversation. Next, it's really thinking through what is the change? What are we going to do differently at the program level? And so that's where my expertise ends, but that's where I would hope the faculty have a lot of expertise to bring to bear, and Diane and Stephanie and the Biggio Center have a lot of expertise to bring to the table, too. And finally, it's really thinking through that improvement timetable. So if we really want to go on learning improvement initiative, it's not going to happen in a year, just because the changes are going to be a while to happen, and then it's, you've got to wait for the students to experience them. So our programs are two to four years long, a course is one semester, you could change that for improvement every a couple times a year, right? But the program is much bigger and it takes a lot longer to evidence that improvement. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you all to fill out a learning improvement brainstorm. So I apologize that we've been on a little bit of the sad state of affairs, but I want to be honest with you all about the national landscape. This is not an Auburn specific issue, this is a everyone in the nation issue. But now I want us to start thinking on a more positive side. So, okay, let's remove the barriers. Can we do this and what would it look like? 
So what I'd like you to do is take about five minutes just to fill out this worksheet on your own. And then we're gonna, I'm going to ask that you find a partner to share what you put in the worksheet. All right, everyone, if we could come all back together. I'd like to ask if any of you would like to share part of your conversation or any wonderings you have or things that came up you want to share with others. Any volunteers? Deborah had a good one. <laughs> <laughs> or throw your colleague under the bus. Or <laughs> throw your colleague under the bus. It was a good one. I'd say it was a bad one. That would be throw your under the Master's program. Okay. So clearly one of the things that we in an ideal world would like for them is to have a mastery of communication theory mm -hmm. okay, um, when, they, when they leave. And there's obvious reasons for that. But then the first question is what theories? Mm -hmm. you know, and how do we identify those theories? Because of, of, we have a number of people who teach that class. It's taught once a year. And it rotates through about five mm -hmm. different people. And so we all have different areas of expertise. We have four areas of emphasis in the program. I mean, so what, I mean, because if you're going to, if you're going to measure that, it works better if you know exactly what theories they should have mm -hmm. mastered. So just getting so. agreement on what that outcome, unpacking that outcome is yeah. more challenging. Yeah. So the, can I add a little bit? Yeah. The interesting yeah. thing that came out in the conversation was, because, you know, one of the barriers to identify was that, uh, you know, about figuring out which theories to and so then, uh, as uh, we were talking more about it, you know, she said, well, really what they should learn is how to critically evaluate theories. So then maybe it doesn't matter what theories are. Mm. It's the process. So, yeah. And so then that was, you know, yeah. that's, maybe it's easier to build consensus around that. Mm -hmm. What you, level of detail do you focus when you unpack? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll show you an example. So at, at James Madison University, they're piloting two programs through a learning improvement initiative. Um, and one of them comes from communication, the other comes from business, computer information systems. Um, the CIS has had a lot more success because it was easy for them to identify the outcomes, agree about it, and it was something that they weren't really doing already. Communication, on the other hand, they wanted to improve students' ability to persuade. Something about persuasion, I'm probably not mm -hmm. articulating that correctly. But when they tried to get everyone together, it was very apparent that they think about persuasion very, very differently. Mm -hmm. And so they've spent, I think, eight months now just thinking about what do we mean by persuasion. So just step one, identifying the outcome, and then having a common understanding. I mean, they're still progressing, but it was a lot different of an experience than the business example they're piloting. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it just reminds me of the challenge of getting on the same page about what we actually mean when we say a theory or a particular outcome. We had that same conversation over here, and ours was even just taking it a step further, is gaining consensus, consensus from your stakeholders, but not just the faculty, but what is it that students think that they want to know or should know? What is it that the people that, when they graduate and they go work for, what is it that they think they should mm -hmm. know and want to know? So you really have to get a lot of stakeholders involved mm -hmm. in that process of what's important for them to know from the very beginning. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think it's... Um, I've seen some disciplines on campus that are very plugged in to advisory boards and very, like, very inclusive. And then I think there are others that, you know, not just at Auburn, where it's very insular. These are our program, and and then for for good and for good reasons sometimes. Yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs> and they, yeah. uh, Laroon had a good points about the bigger picture of residents' life and all those things. Mm -hmm. Kind of part of university. This was pretty awesome. This was pretty awesome too. Uh, and then you were going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> we we talked about ensuring that we are looking at the program or process holistically, mm -hmm. and as departments or uh, areas of the institution, not looking at just one segment where we know will reflect positively about the institution or the specific department that you're in. So in terms of courses, not just assessing our 8 a.m. major specific courses, but, but assessing across the board everyone that's participating in that because the students who have to take the class are going to be there, they're probably going to do much better than if this was a general requirement course that was offered. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that it's, it's, yeah. it's the best. 
a good point. May I think you were called out <laughs> as having a good example too. Uh, I'm talking about the learning assistance program mm -hmm. that we started in, uh, which is currently the course I'm just trying to uh, expand. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is we have to show assistance. Uh, so we are trying to, uh, we are asked to show assessment again okay, to show that it improves mm -hmm. and it, hmm, we can easily develop an assessment that shows that our program is successful. Mm -hmm. And then everybody will probably be happy for a few years now until tomorrow when it's discovered that this was a, you know, kind of an interesting approach. Mm -hmm. And so of course we don't want to do that. We want to actually show real assessment, but yet, unless we show improvement, we don't get the funding to keep doing the program, and mm -hmm. then we cannot show anything results. So, yeah. so our program, our uh, funders are excellent. They are again physicists. <laughs> so, uh, so he's given us uh, some extra time to show that uh, mm -hmm. this is actually working. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm doing an experiment right now to show that it works and have some assessment going on, mm -hmm. uh, which I believe is genuine, which I need to talk to some experts about. And, yeah. and uh, there are, I know what the barriers are or what the things are that are, that will not make this a perfect uh, assessment, mm -hmm. uh, which will happen again in the next semester. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things. So keep doing the program. We need mm -hmm. the assessment to keep the program running and we need to keep the program to get the assessment that mm -hmm. is requested of us. Right. So it's that vicious cycle that uh, yeah. can break or sustain. Mm -hmm. Drop the racer, he needs it. I don't want him to fall on his head. Awesome. I think it brings a really good, a really good tension though when you think about the outcome and its curricular alignment and then when we get to measurement, developing a measure that's sensitive enough to capture where students are but leave room for improvement. So if you create a measure from the get-go that your students are all going to max out on, on the one hand that tells a nice story, like our students are learning a lot, but it doesn't allow you the opportunity to improve or to show that growth after you do an improvement initiative. It's a great point. Thank Can you. I ask a question about the yeah. tension between sometimes engagement and achievement? Because mm -hmm. when we talk about the 6% for instance, it's so a learning gain over time, but that doesn't necessarily capture engagement. For instance, if you're doing a media math, by some math faculty we support here at the Beaker Center where they, talk, they teach uh, remedial math class. Mm -hmm. So these are not math majors. They're not necessarily invested in math. So just the ability to retain them, right, mm -hmm. say from 80% of retention rate to 85% of 9%, or say 35% of retention mm -hmm. to 60, 80, 90, mm -hmm. that's a huge growth mm -hmm. over time. Another one is engagement, investment during the actual mm -hmm. instructional process. Like, how many people participate in class? How many do homework? And same growth in that, because sometimes you might have those two components, mm -hmm. retention rates going up, engagement, participation, investment, effort going up, but having a decline or no net percentable impact on the learning grade, like mm. GPA. So to think about the whole program holistically on multiple holistically. metrics, not because just like What learning. I mean is said, mm -hmm. if you're looking for funding, Someone's not looking for engagement or retention. They're looking for, did they move the grade point GPA mm -hmm. over time, both at the college level and also at the school level? Mm -hmm. It's just what you get the funding for. Yeah. Well, for, first, I think that's a great perspective. You do have to think about the program as a whole. And if you can't retain students, then your assessment of the learning of the students that maintain is only so meaningful, right? So issue one, definitely retention. Um, and two, thinking about the program holistically and that it could be possible that there's some things going on within the program that are improving, but we're not seeing it on that outcome. This all is beyond the scope of my expertise, though, and I immediately think of Stephanie, because I know during your job talk you talked about motivation research and trying to help students be more engaged, and that's where I hope, I don't have the answers, but I know I can do assessment really well, and I know that these folks have some things to bear that maybe if we got the content experts, assessment, and curricular people at the table, we might be able to do some especially cool things. Not that you can't do cool things independently. But yeah. Are there other things anyone would like to share? I mean, isn't that what the promise of the 6% is? <coughs> like, it's a sad story, but it's also like, if you're a researcher and you find this little field of promise, it's awesome. So there's like, 94% room for us to make an impact as a university yes. by learning improvement. Yes. 
Thank you, Diane. That will transition me to my next slide, <laughs> <laughs> which is my last slide. And I, and, you know, we'll have some time for question. But I am curious. So I too think about this as a huge area of opportunity. The entire nation is not doing so great at learning improvement, which is the promise of assessment that everyone has to do. So on the one hand, I'm like, we get one program, we send as much resources into it and highlight it. I mean, it's a huge accomplishment if we could get one program to demonstrate learning improvement. So I think there's a lot of potential and opportunity for programs to move in this direction. And I also think the whole conversation is created from this pig paper. And so James Madison's already on the, already going forward with pilot programs. They've got some data already on their pre-assessment and they're doing curricular innovations with their teaching and learning center. Alabama is starting now to think about learning improvement on campus. We can't have Auburn not a part of this conversation for multiple reasons, right? So I think it's an opportunity for us as a university, how can we become a leader in learning improvement? Which right now there are no leaders. There's barely any existence of it. So I was hoping we could maybe strategize and brainstorm together. Or should we not be? I'm open to this terrible idea. Nobody cares, Megan. You can say those comments. It's fine. Which funding it? The James Madison and the Alabama project? Because the, small, the pilot project you described, that's exciting. Because they can actually have quantifiable data yes. to say, this is what's happening. This is what we think we can do. Yes. But what's behind the push? Is there any national funding for it, an agency funding? There's not agency funding right now, and actually JMU has no additional resources to pilot this. They're thinking of it as a proof of concept to then ask their administrators for more funds for teaching and learning and assessment to work together more systematically. Does US News and other ranking organizations value this metric in their rankings? They do not, and they also have, that would help? They also have no metrics of student learning at all in the current ranking systems. Makes perfect sense. That's right. how we rank institutions of learning. But just because it doesn't exist doesn't mean we can't be the first to tell a different story. Well, that was the next thing was provide incentive. Provide incentive? I think internally, I think about assessment not being communicated as, as well as it could be. So mm -hmm. um, we work in auxiliary services, technically. So we're the most student development focused area in auxiliary services. Um, and so I don't necessarily see assessment being a core value of auxiliary services. Um, but I also think that we, because we're very student development focused, mm -hmm. we don't have as many opportunities to reach across the aisle of student affairs and be able to collaborate as much as we could. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things I've seen be really successful is assessment steering committees at, a, at an institutional cross um, division level because mm -hmm. having a point person that's saying, okay, well this is when Nessie's happening. Let's not do this at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to have it be very strategic mm -hmm. uh, amongst a division and across the institution, I think that's very valuable mm -hmm. and it demonstrates that it's a, a core value of the institution. It's a priority. Mm -hmm. awesome. I do see a commitment on campus towards, uh, I'm not sure about if implementing or exploring, whichever word is the right one, but uh, um, around programmatic portfolios, mm -hmm. portfolios. Mm -hmm. and I mean they lend themselves pretty easily to you know, assessment. On the surface, but well, just through conversations with Margaret and Leslie, um, what many other institutions think of as an e-portfolio is a gathering ground for all of the students' work for then faculty right. to evaluate for assessment purposes. But the ePortfolio project at Auburn is more about a metacognitive development within the students. So like, I'm about to graduate, I've just had four years of courses, who am I and what did I just do for four years? Can I articulate that personally? And so I think they don't want to, I'm going to say handcuff what that project can become for assessment purposes. But I, I, see, where you're, I see where you're going with that and I think it's... Because instead of it being a capstone, if it was a building block over mm -hmm. time... And maybe we could assess the student learning outcomes of that project and think of learning. So then the student that deciding, way. oh, what are my, you know, key exemplary, mm -hmm. you know, tasks that I've completed, they can look back and say, oh, here's how I've progressed. And, yeah. Uh, that would That's we use e-portfolios for our returning RA selection process. So any of our staff that are interested in returning had, were required this year to make an e-portfolio about their experience, uh, which was really valuable for us because some of them were very funny. Um, but it was a, a good tool for them to be able to uh, frame their experience. Mm -hmm. They framed it through 
community development, policy enforcement relationships developed. And so uh, it was really meaningful for us when we were when we're, we're currently doing returning our interviews. Uh, being uh, being able to talk to them, what was your what was your shining moment of this experience? And they were able to have that much quicker because mm -hmm. of the fact that they developed that. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a spotlight the six percent at Auburn? You know, I'm guessing that there's about maybe five or six percent of programs at Auburn that do it really well. And, we were able to share the examples. Of I think my, my sense of the culture at Auburn, and I think this is true at many places, is that there's a lot of, there's some pockets of really awesome assessment, and then there's some pockets of these huge curricular changes and innovations, but I don't think that they're synced. Being assessed. Yeah. Or, or if you start something new, folks don't often think to make a pre-assessment where you know it's going to be bad. But it has to be very thoughtful on the front end, because you can't change it over the next two to four years. It was complicated. But I like the idea of if we do move forward and we start to get examples, how can we highlight you know, these types of programs? And that's a good idea. Other thoughts? Do you all have any questions so far? We're at the end. <laughs> what does it look like in your vision, right? I mean, just being here almost a year. Yeah. What does success look like to you? So for me, for no, it's question. good. Um, in, for me, in 2020, we would have five out of 250 programs on the track towards learning improvement. And I think that's a reasonable amount. The challenge, though, is that we kind of skimmed over assessment, right? Like, oh, you have to have perfect measure in place and then all these other things. And for some programs, that assessment step needs to get some devotion. And to me, though, if we can think about assessment on the front end, in what are the outcomes that are most meaningful to us? Not just the outcomes that are easiest to measure or that come to mind very easily. Like, what do the faculty truly care about? And if we start at the beginning in a meaningful way, I think learning improvement will be a nice, natural next step, even though we would need a lot of help from the Biggio Center and what that actually looks like and how to facilitate conversations among faculty. So it's a, it's a lot packed into it, but I think we can move in that direction if anybody is interested in doing it. So. Man. Are there resources that you can read up about assessment and then speak kind of pseudo intelligently on this topic to the people who are requesting assessments, for example? People who are requesting assessments. To, uh, so, I think, so this is what we did and why we did it is because fancy terms. Those kind of things. So where do we get those fancy terms? I'm just using fancy terms as in official language or whatever it's called. Oh, like the assessment lingo? Mm -hmm. Lingo, yes. Oh, um, there's some good books by, my favorite is by Linda Susky, who she just does a good job of talking about assessment, and it goes into the mechanics of assessment. Um, I'm also happy to help with kind of the lingo, and a lot of the resources that I'm putting out for assessment talk about things in a consistent way. Can Diane? you spell Suski? Oh, sorry. S-U-S-K-I-E. Okay. So there are many. Things get picked up when you said, there's a great book by Linda Suski. <laughs> and then no writing. <laughs> <laughs> Reflection on how to yes. spell. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. What, what's the name of the book by Linda Suski, do you know? Assessments and student learning are probably in the title. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but one of them is called Common Sense, and I don't know if that's her or a different author I'm thinking of. I'll look it up. It might just be assessment of student learning. Does your accreditation have standards specific to assessment? Mm, it, it, it's a little weird because this program has been very successful elsewhere, and we're going to show that it is successful in our, but using those same assessment techniques has not really yielded any positive results. Do you have specialized accreditation? Not really. So we are, we are doing what okay. the others did. Mm -hmm. okay. And so those are kind of the standard ones. But it's a, it's a, pro, it's a mainly like a discipline-based program also. Mm -hmm. So it's a big program and then it's like within discipline. Mm -hmm. So okay. it, can, it could probably be successful in one but not in the other. Mm -hmm. The, no. book, the book by Linda Suski is Assessing Student Learning, A Common Sense Guide. Oh, it was common sense. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
One coil. And I have an ISBN number in case anyone's in. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. If you have questions about assessment mechanics, so the details that are inside that assessment cycle, I'm going to put on workshops starting February 22nd through pretty much the rest of the semester on each of those big areas. So I'm happy to give you a resource on that. Or if you want to talk really big picture, I like doing that also. So, Megan, if you'll send the, the dates and locations, yeah. I can include that list in the file. In the, well, it can be included in the request for feedback on the session. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.